Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. William Kelly. He is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and the Sumitomo Professor Emeritus of Japanese Studies at Yale University. He has done lots of work on the social and historical anthropology of Japan and focused most of his research for two decades on regional society in Japan based on extensive field work in the Shonai area of Yamagata Prefecture. He has also written widely on the broader dynamics of class formation in Japanese society. At the same time, much of his research for the past two decades has explored sport and body culture and their significance in modern Japan. And he has also written on the history of Japan anthropology and its importance for Japan studies and for sociocultural anthropology. And today we're going to talk a bit about all of that. So Dr. Kelly, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much. I look forward to our conversation. Okay, so let's start with uh, a bit of your field work in Japan. You've done quite a lot of it. Uh, and I would like to ask you, first of all, about uh, some of the work you've done on the or in the Shonai area of Yamagata Prefecture. So what did you study there exactly? Well, certainly, I uh, began that study in graduate school in the doctoral program in anthropology back in the early 70s. Um, I had majored in anthropology as an undergraduate, um, although I was not a particularly studious uh, student. I taught high school for a couple of years, anthropology and history, did some traveling, and then went back to graduate school. <clears throat> and after the first two semesters of seminars, the particular program, this was in Boston, um, sent us for three months in the summer, told us to go somewhere in the northeastern U.S. and eastern Canada and find a place and settle in and do uh, what they call field work um, and try to understand what was going on in that local area. Mm -hmm. um, our supervisor required us to take notes every night and at the end of each week uh, to hold us to some uh, discipline. And I found myself in an area on the border of the United States and Canada that was in the middle of the woods up in northern Maine. And this was a small community settlement of some 200 individuals in with a few surnames seemed to be quite remote, quite distant from uh, the rest of uh, Maine, um, but it turned out to be at the center of an international lumbering operations. Um, this had been lumbered for some uh, 80 years before. There were now sort of large crews of Canadians coming over, getting contracts from international companies. And this small settlement of individuals were trying to survive in the midst of a national and actually international uh, political economy. Um, and it taught me immediately about the ways in which a seemingly isolated uh, rural settlement might in fact be uh, embedded in a very daily uh, sense in a much larger uh, social framework. And so when I uh, decided that I would work in Japan, as uh, my dissertation uh, project, um, I thought that an analog to that um, would be um, rural settlements in what was, in the case of Japan, um, an agriculture that was largely built on irrigated agriculture. Um, so was a form of agriculture that was quite important in many parts of the world, um, so it might have some comparable uh, significance. <clears throat> and so that became the dissertation uh, um, surveying what was written about uh, the Japanese countryside. Um, there was actually an enormous sort of academic and ideological investment in Japanese villages, 
um, and the communities that they were supposed to represent, mm -hmm. the area I ended up um, moving to and, and studying through field work was a, a, a flat plain surrounded by mountains up in the north. Um, it was about um, 15 kilometers wide and maybe 70 kilometers uh, from north to south. And if you looked at it, kind of a bird's eye view, you would see some five or 600 very nucleated settlements of anywhere from 20 to 40 uh, houses um, packed together, surrounded by um, rice fields. And the rice fields were these small, I mean, a rice field is is a field, but it's also actually a, a, an aquatic environment because there are these small bunds that contain the water um, during the season for the rice to grow. And there will be hundreds and hundreds of these parcels um, surrounding these uh, villages. So they seem to be from the outside, um, this kind of uh, geographical display of discrete communities. And if you entered these villages, what you would find would be sort of dense networks of, of clubs and associations and there were children's clubs and there was a young wives uh, association and a young farmers association and a, and a residence association and the shrine association very densely organized with formal um, as, uh, associations but my suspicion was that water and land didn't map together quite as simply as here's a village and the village controls the water and the households use the land and they must cooperate um, as an enduring uh, uh, community over the years in order to uh, ensure their productive, uh, their, their, their productive continuity. Most irrigation in most of the world comes off of rivers. And what that means is big gallon and that canal branches into smaller canals and it's a very tree-like dendritic kind of, of, of formation um, of the landscape, of the waterscape. Um, and after um, living there for a number of years, two years in total, it became quite obvious that the ways in which the irrigation divided the landscape um, and people's uh, work lives didn't very closely match the settlement patterns um, that people who lived in the same settlement often had interests um, in uh, the use of the water and in water rights um, that bonded them with uh, residents of other settlements and set them against um, some of their neighbors. A very complicated situation. Um, and when one looked at the other aspect that came out of the fieldwork itself that I hadn't quite anticipated was, again, Japan, like many countrysides, um, inheritance and succession um, goes to um, one of the children. Um, in Japan, is typically the eldest son. What that means is that the younger sons and the daughters um, must leave, um, married into other households, um, always um, households at least outside that settlement, if not outside um, that region. And the son who succeeds to the farm, uh, to, the, to the family um, uh, economy, um, has a bride who marries in from another village somewhere else in the region. And what that means is that, you know, this notion that is baked into our own sort of classical social theory and certainly the Japanese notions of the countryside that um, before there was urbanization and industrialization and secularization and the transformations that were so um, astutely and poignantly rendered by Marx and Durkheim and Weber, you know, presuming that the countryside was made up of these very permanent, perduring, solitary um, settlement units, in fact, was marked much more by mobility than permanence. Um, over half the people in any settlement were not, in fact, born and raised and died there. You know, that was the fate of the oldest son only.
um, that all of his siblings would leave. There was an outflow of population. Um, and most of the women who came in as brides and remained as mothers and grandmothers had been raised in other villages in other areas. That is the 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 real condition of the countryside in Japan, um, and I think this is true in many other places, is actually the opposite of what we tend to presume, either as as academics, as theorists, but also as in metropolitan areas and takes the train, you know, across Spain or Portugal or France and looks out and sees these uh, very picturesque little villages and imagines that these are three or four or five generations of, of peasant farmers um, living in communal solidarity. In fact, for a long, long time, um, the condition has been of constant mobility in and out. So that the whole issue of, of social order, of social organization, is actually a response to mobility. It's not, doesn't spring naturally from the facts of everyone living together for a long, long time. Um, and that, as I say, that really shaped my appreciation for a countryside that was in constant motion as the, mm -hmm. as the condition, rather than in permanency now being disturbed by the forces of the larger society. Um, and so that was sort of the beginnings of trying to understand um, how that countryside was put together, to what extent the sort of the natural conditions of land and water um, and history had created um, the conditions of life that is really at the center of what social cultural anthropologists are trying to, to understand and capture and represent. So, but let me ask you one question about that, about the Japanese countryside and uh, the ethnographic work you've done there. So, uh, do you think that the sort of family dynamics you pointed to related to mobility and so on, does it apply specifically to the Japanese countryside and the way we find the, the uh, those society those micro societies let's say organized in mm -hmm. that particular ecology with the rice fields and uh, all the social organization that you described or do you think it's a microcosm of what we see uh, across Japanese society more generally and that might also occur to some extent in other uh, environments in Japan, like, for example, more cosmopolitan areas? I mean, is it specific to the countryside <clears throat> or is it, or, or do you see it manifesting uh, in Japanese society more generally? Well, I think it's true. I think it's the second. I think it's true more generally in Japanese okay. society and, and okay. similar conditions obtain elsewhere. Uh, it's not my work, but others who have looked, for example, in uh, in Tokyo, when it was called Edo in the pre-modern times, um, in neighborhoods, uh, downtown neighborhoods that seem to be long-standing traditional neighborhoods. Um, and there were population registers, um, as in France for early modern historians um, that were kept going back to the 1600s. Um, and again, what people presume to be fairly permanent, small downtown neighborhoods, when you actually look at the registers, there are people moving in and out on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that the neighborhood remains as a social, political, economic presence, but the people themselves are um, rising and falling in their fortunes, um, in their family circumstances, um, so that the, that the actual flow of population and how that population is then fitted into the local forms of economy and administration becomes the problem of social order. And we have this, again, this kind of Durkheimian sense that in the past social order was fairly fixed and permanent and then it became um, 
turbulent and transformative and 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 mobile and ever changing um, in the process of ninth, late 19th early 20th century modernity but in fact that's not really to my mind the experience in Japan and from my understandings of, of research elsewhere um, it's probably a more general condition um, of societies um, uh, Europe in Latin America. And, and you have also studied some of the history of Japan. So what historic periods have you focused your research on and how does that research connect to some of your ethnographic uh, studies, you think? Yeah, no, that, that, that's an important question, which also tests some of the initial uh, conclusions um, that I was drawing from my uh, dissertation uh, fieldwork um, mm -hmm. because one might say well this condition of constant flow um, and the the challenges of social organization that that presents um, perhaps that's simply a function of the present moment I was there in the 1970s so maybe things were not like that um, they more conform to the conventional view of countrysides um, in earlier periods. And so I was led back through uh, a very extensive documentary archival um, a record to um, earlier centuries in that same region. Um, this was a region in the north that really wasn't occupied and settled until the early 1600s. There are parts of Japan, obviously, that go back millennia. Um, but I was interested in how in the early 17th century, this plain came to be occupied and developed for agriculture. And then at the same time as it was the domain of organized into Tokugawa's name of mm -hmm. this family of originally military generals who established a kind of hegemony over the entire country but in a very ingenious fashion by not by controlling the entire country uh, the country direct uh, but by uh, demanding sort of personal fealty from several hundred lesser domain lords who were given their own independent territories but who owed direct service to the Tokugawa shogun um, who sat in Edo Castle. And so this region, like regions throughout the country, um, was part of a, of a tributary political order um, that was I mean, in, ingenious. It was oppressive, but it was in, ingenious in maintaining itself for over 250 years. It was remarkably, remarkably stable. One Of the important. So, Japan's significance for um, a, a larger questions of history and development at the time, back in the 20th century, was how was it that Japan was from the late 19th century, perhaps the, if not the first, at least the the society that moved the quickest. Um, in the non-Western world to the ranks of Western powers, not just mm -hmm. economically, but uh, militarily, it became its own imperial um, nation by the end of the 19th century when it invaded um, China and then Korea and um, tried to develop a rival mm -hmm. empire to the Western powers. And so the, the issue that really was at the center of, of understanding Japan was whether that happened because Japan, uh, the Western powers encountered Japan and introduced Western ideas. Was it Westernization or was modernization in the Japanese idiom mm -hmm. an instance of pre-existing conditions that um, once the engagement with uh, Western powers uh, was a kind of catalyst for for instance, it turns out on the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century in Japan that rural literacy, 
was far in advance of literacy in Europe at the same time. And part of this was a system of local Buddhist temples in almost all of the settlements. There'd be a village priest. Um, and one of his activities was to teach basic reading and numerical skills, um, particularly to the boys, but also to a certain extent to the girls. So you had this remarkable of, of functional literacy um, of reading and, and numbers before Japan thought about bringing in a factory. You bring in a factory, but you already have a pre-existing um, population, um, working potential working population who have the kind of literacy that make them immediately productive and useful to the manufacturing. So in this, in a number of different ways, um, the countrysides um, as well as the cities um, had these kind of pre-existing conditions um, that um, could be immediately mobilized, didn't have to be generated themselves. And so part of the explanation for um, Japan's somewhat peculiar um, position in the 20th century vis-a-vis -vis, um, Western powers and vis-a-vis -vis its Asian neighbors um, was the way in which the society sort of inadvertently um, was setting itself up for um, the kinds of demand a new state would make for political and economic um, uh, preeminence. And so uh, how does a class work in Japan and how do classes form in Japan? Because, uh, and uh, related to that, uh, do you think or do you look at Japanese society as a sp uh, specially hierarchical one? Because uh, I mean, I, I am familiar with some uh, with Japanese culture to some extent and I know that, for example, and I'm mentioning this because I think it might play some role here. Uh, they use honorifics when referring to different people uh, at the end of the name. Uh, for example, they use San, Sama, Senpai, Sensei, mm -hmm. uh, all to refer to people that are above them hierarchically. Right. Right. So um, what, what do you think about, that, about the class and the hierarchy right. in Japan and how it works? Yeah, no, it's a it's a fascinating issue, and Japan is a. I mean, obviously, linguistically encoded hierarchy is fairly common throughout the world. But the ways in which that works, and the kinds of of hierarchical structures that it expresses and and defends, um, varies caste systems in in India, for instance, and other places. Uh, but Japan is is especially interesting because of the several hierarchy and, and this tension between hierarchy and a kind of strain towards egalitarian or standardization that you saw in the 20th century. In those centuries before um, 1868, um, it was very much a formal hierarchy of the warriors and the farmers and the craftspeople and the merchants so that you had a, a social stratification, a kind of a pre-modern social stratification that was quite clear um, and had all sorts of entailments. The samurai warriors could carry swords and, and, and so on. Um, you also had your reference to the use of language to identify sensei teachers or a, a subordinate or a senior is actually a kind of situational hierarchy so that you know somebody's senior might be somebody else's junior so this language mm -hmm. actually expresses a kind of relative hierarchy depending upon the situation who you're meeting and who you're who you're talking to and who you see yourself vis-a-vis -vis, which is why for instance uh, Japan is famous for its name cards um, it's so-called so-called meishi that you produce on introduction, not only to identify your name, um, but and also your company, but also your rank, so that you can very quickly look at the person's name card and see well if he's 
if he's a department head and I'm just a section head, then he immediately becomes my senior. Mm -hmm. But if I'm a section head and he's a section head, we have to so you can kind of hire um, that is expressed in Japan that doesn't always map onto the first kind of hierarchy. Um, and then you had, after World War II, in the second half of the 20th century, you had another kind of, well, some would say national project, but a national discourse about we Japanese are all the same. The sort of mm -hmm. sense of of what I what I've what I've called, or it's a term that was much used in Japan in public talk from the 1950s, 1960s on, kind of a mainstream consciousness, um, and it's a which is a, a translation, a literal translation of a Japanese term, chudyu, which is the mainstream of a river, and iski, which is consciousness, and people being sort of conscious of being more or less in the same life situation, um, right. which didn't, didn't eliminate the linguistic hierarchy. I mean, I still called the sensei I met in my Japanese university sensei, um, but it did add yet a third dimension to people's sense of, of who they were vis-a-vis -vis the people around them, their, their fellow, their fellow right. Japanese. And so Japan was this it was situation in which you had these three different sort of forms of association um, that uh, it, it, it sometimes coexisted, sometimes followed one another. Um, and now you have in the 21st century, um, there's very little talk, public talk about mainstream consciousness and a lot more talk about social inequality and increasing sort of economic uh, disparity. So this is, you know, this is a, a society which cannot be um, characterized in a kind of ahistorical singular singular fashion over the last 150 years it's gone through. I mean, what is interesting in my final uh, suggestion to your, to your question is Japan and the United States may be different in a number of dimensions, but probably thinking about the second half of the 20th century, they are the two like OECD countries that most avoided talking about class. In the United States, you know, the public talk for 50, 60 years is, you know, we, we're all middle class. You know, we don't have any, you know, I mean, we do, but we, we try assiduously to avoid talking about class differences in stratification. And the same was true in Japan after World War II. There was an effort um, to, to, to talk about things as if um, there was a fairly broad consensus about what life was and people's place within, within that life. Whereas for European countries, they're all different inflections of class awareness um, and class stratification, all different sort of political complexions of that represent a class. But class has always remained um, salient to people's sense of themselves and their their locations within society. And Japan and the U.S. are some outliers um, in working hard to avoid um, that kind of talk. Uh, yes, but uh, even if. Uh, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but even if to some extent uh, the honorifics they use mm -hmm. might over time lose some of their meaning, I mean, they become just, mm -hmm. let's say, historical artifacts of the Japanese language. They keep mm -hmm. using san, sama and honorifics mm -hmm. like that just because they are part of the language, but they no longer hold the same uh, class or hierarchical meaning they used to, uh, it's still interesting to see how they really mark their, their rank when they are referring to other people and when other people refer to them through these different uh, honorifics. Right. No, you're, you're quite right. I mean, they're, they're not to be dismissed and they remain salient. What's yeah. interesting is, 
the ways in which these linguistic markers of of relative position mm -hmm. uh, can be manipulated and deployed and the the number of people for instance who want to see themselves as sensei um, you know originally it was like tea masters and calligraph master calligraphers and the like and now you know, chefs want to be known as sensei, and and uh, there's a whole so that the the use of the because the term signifies, as you say, this kind of claim to expertise and authority. Yeah. It becomes a term that people sort of strive to acquire and to be to be known for. Um, likewise, I mean, it's it's it is. A residual in the family system. Um, there is there is a term for brother, but it's very awkward and it doesn't it isn't used in common conversation. Rather, you need to specify if it's the older brother or the younger brother. Yeah. Um, and you need to specify if it is the a male sibling or a female sibling. So the the order of sibling is baked into the language of address <clears throat> that people must use. Um, now the meaning of the oldest son, you know, carried a very different weight um, earlier than it does now. But you still talk about your older brother as as your older brother, not as your brother. There is, this, as I say, it's. The, the language kind of forces a, an awareness of relative status, but what the system of status is behind that is is always in flux. I think that's part of the sort of the fascination of Japan, but also to an anthropologist you know, who's really interested in how people negotiate their lives day by day and what the resources are and what the constraints are. Um, uh, and brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, the word the the words they use end in san, right? Mm -hmm. or, or ne san and mm -hmm. or right. ni san, right? Right, right. Yes. So, yeah. so, so the, the, still again the the hierar the sort of hierarchical mark. Right. right, right, right. And it's actually it's a kind of a a grid, a vertical and horizontal, because you're, as you're saying, there's san, sama, and san, and kun is actually a, an, an informal form. So that one line of differentiation is the formal to the informal. Mm -hmm. And a second line of differentiation is the senior to the junior, or right. the, uh, uh, the superordinate to the subordinate. And so it becomes a, a, a very, uh, well, complicated, but also sort of potentially strategic uh, form of interacting with one another. Because you're always, you know, you have to kind of decide how formal, you know, are, are we going to be in this particular situation? We have to be constantly calculating, well, you know, who are you and where are we? Because the way I would interact with my sensei in one setting would be different and the language I would use would be different than how I would interact with him or her in another more informal setting. Right. So it's this, it's this intensely situational um, style of social interaction that requires you know, a sensitivity to relative position <clears throat> and the language that you have available in, in Japanese to express that or to 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 manipulate that um, and a, a, a sense of the of the of the the situations and their their degree of formality and informality which I would imagine for an anthropologist uh, would be very interesting to see these or, or to notice these linguistic markers because of course 
uh, in their society they have their own language norms and they know where and uh, wh how and why to apply each right. specific honorific but for someone looking from the outside just hearing them or reading them use the each specific honorific from it alone we can right. take a lot of information about the relationship between two particular people in Japan. Yes, very much so, yes. Okay, so um, talking uh, about contemporary Japan and particularly the metropolitan areas, what would you say are some of the main uh, social challenges that people are going through because uh, I mean whenever I hear about Japan I hear about things like for example uh, singlehood uh, I hear about the so-called hikikomori there is people who just ex uh, sort of exclude themselves from social life due to mm -hmm. different reasons but particularly because they feel very society to really uh, achieve or uh, uh, to achieve uh, academically and professionally and so on and they just exclude themselves from society also the uh, high rates of suicide so um, I, I mean which of those are do you think are really the most problematic and what would you say are the per, perhaps uh, i don't know some of the root causes behind them yeah well i think they're, they're all problematic but in different ways some of them are real problems and others are problematic because they 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 touch on uh, stereotypes of the japanese that don't that don't hold up but all three of those are excellent examples in fact i noticed over just over the last couple of days um the guardian and actually the the uh, the correspondent of the Guardian in Japan, Justin McCurry, is is a, is a, a very astute uh, reporter. He's been there a long time, and and I respect some of his stories. But he had a a, a story about um, and how the COVID uh, pandemic had only increased. Um, the number of these hikikomori sort of self-designated shut-ins um, mm -hmm. and the intense uh, anxiety that the government feels about these rising uh, numbers. And the New York Times followed that uh, a couple of days ago. And again, the, the, the head of the, of the Times there, Motoko Rich, is one of the better uh, journalists reporting from Japan um, over the time's long history, but she had a story that got much play in the newspaper about a smile coach um, that the Japanese had been wearing masks during COVID now for three years and finally beginning to take them off. And then somehow these Japanese are so socially anxious and immature that they have to go out and hire this woman uh, in order to learn how to smile again because they're having to expose their faces to one another after this long period of seclusion and these strike me as an anthropologist who've been engaged in japan for 50 years to be i mean on one level they're silly on another level it, it's quite unfortunate that japan continues after 150 years to play this role in the Western imaginary as a kind of wacky topsy-turvy <laughs> land um, where they just still haven't figured out how to act as mature individuals. Um, but having said that, I mean, you also you know, touch on some serious contemporary issues that are hardly distinctive to Japan. In many ways, you know, uh, people I have argued that Japan is a kind of canary in the mine, in that what happens in Japan is actually about to happen in many other places. Um, although in the case of solo living and solo formations, Japan and Eastern Portugal and Spain, Eastern Europe, um, parts of Indonesia, I mean, the, the, the notion of the, uh, the domestic heterosexual um, 
nuclear family was not a fiction of the 20th century, but it was a dominant ideology of the 20th century that was not actually expressed as statistically as much as we assumed it to be. Um, and that that certainly is being replaced by what other social scientists talk about as a second demographic transition um, into, um, a, into societies in which living alone um, has become much more the norm um, or the statistical norm, not the ideological norm, the statistical norm. Um, and this has been important in Japan um, at least since the 1990s. Um, the, the, the significance in Japan and to the Japanese was in part because the decades before, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, had really enshrined <clears throat> the nuclear family. Uh, the husband who went off to work in the company and the mother who stayed home as, and the, the actual term was professional housewife, who was housewife, house, homemaker and mother uh, to her children. And so you had that sort of national ideal that in fact was a statistical minority, but still ideologically important. And all of a sudden in the 1990s, there were two things happening simultaneously. That's why solo is, is a bit uh, simplistic because it's happening in different age levels in different forms. But the 20 somethings decided not to get married. Um, and particularly it was the women who decided not to get married. Early on, Japan, earlier than say Korea or Greece or Italy or the like, mm -hmm. um, the age of marriage started to rise, the age of, and the, the intentions to get married um, statistically started. So you had a lot of younger people who uh, were living unmarried, um, often by themselves, um, if you're living in metropolitan areas in Tokyo or Osaka, like, like Europe, you're living in a very small place because you don't have the resources for something larger. Right. So you had this kind of urban ecology that was uh, developing as a pattern because people were, uh, to a certain extent, making choices, to a certain extent, unable to generate the resources um, the kind of, of, of permanent jobs and job security that they felt necessary to get married. So this, this was happening at the same time as you had an aging society. So the, uh, let me just please interrupt you there for a sure. second. Uh, uh, isn't it the case that, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but in the late 80s, early 90s, there was an economic crisis mm -hmm. in Japan, correct? And isn't that the case that that was on one of the root causes behind some of those changes in social dynamics, like, for example, the, law, the losing job security and perhaps losing financial resources? And uh, also, I guess, somewhat related to that, the fact that if people uh, weren't marrying anymore because uh, I mean there weren't really there, there were people that have been processed they had before in terms of economic security, job security, and all of that. Am I correct here? You're or? precisely right. Um, the 1980s for Japan was it was a boom. Um, and with like most economic booms, you could pretty much predict there was a bust coming, but people <laughs> acted as if it wouldn't come. And as you say, it came in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, in the 1980s, I saw these, these charts at the height of trade frictions with Europe, the US and Japan, that 12 of the 15 largest banks in the world were Japanese. Now yeah. they, they don't exist in the top 20. But there was this moment in which the boys were taking them, and then um, it was a combination of uh, corporate miscalculation and 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 bank overreach and the like. There was a fairly sudden collapse, and that meant that the kind of corporate employment that was important to and carefully linked to university graduation and to people's calculations of marriage. Um, I mean, it wasn't the, the only cause. Uh, 
because uh, it seemed to be from sort of you know, kind of qualitative field work, but government surveys and studies that it was more women than men who uh, lost interest in, well, they were interested in marriage, but they just weren't interested in all those men around them that would be actual potential marriage partners because they didn't have the jobs, because yeah. um, they couldn't afford the kind, because they couldn't afford the, the daycare um, if they wanted to continue working so that there was an increase in in part-time and temporary non-regular employment um, that drew in a lot of women into longer periods of employment um, and who did not want actually found the prospects of marriage with a man who didn't have a secure job who might have had family obligations that would fall on her and not on him um, wanted to have children whom they knew they could not find adequate daycare. I mean, there's this, this, this tangle of, of, of self-reinforcing circumstances that appeared in the early 90s. Again, we see in other societies, but Japan early on, and given the, the, the previous decades, it was, it was such a, a sort of a, a, a subjective uh, a shift in, in, in consciousness. And the, the, the other thing I'm take was the rise of solo living um, among seniors because uh, life expectancy had increased enormously. The retirement ages were still in the 60s um, and um, women were outliving men. Um, and the families, you know, for instance, the, the, the household I, I've spent most of my 50 years in and been the, the, the son uh, who was in his 20s when I was in my 20s, in his 70s now, had a brother, a younger brother and sister who moved immediately to Tokyo after high school. Um, they, you know, there's no one to take care of them. You know, they live by themselves as solo um, in, in Tokyo. So you had this rise of solo living both at the senior end um, and um, among 20-somethings and now 30-somethings and now even into 40-somethings um, so that solo living actually is this and you had I mean in a sense solo living in the sense of one child I mean one child lives in a family but one child sort of lives by himself or herself yeah. without without siblings and that's a kind of experience of, of, of quasi solo living at the earliest uh, stages of the life cycle. So this whole, you know, how a society sort of reshapes itself to acknowledge and uh, dis and sort of see itself as a as as a society of of largely solo residencies um, is what is challenging Japan at the present time. And, and with Lessons, many other places as well. And particularly, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but when it came to job security, it was really a drastic shift because, if I'm not mistaken, up till the late 80s, uh, because uh, in Japan it's curious that I think in terms of workplace culture, at least up till the 80s, I think that what happened was that people who were able to go to university after they finished university, they would securely land a job at a, a big, in a big corporation and it would be a job for life. I mean, they would be settled for life. It wouldn't be like we are more used to here in Europe or in North America, where rarely we have one single job for our entire lives. But in Japan, that was more or less how the system worked. And then after the economic crisis, the, that kind of job stability sort uh, wasn't there anymore, at least for uh, a huge chunk of the Japanese population. Mm -hmm. right. No, you're, you're quite right. Although one would want to distinguish between, in a sense, I wouldn't say image and reality, but that modeling of employment and 
the actual distribution of employment during okay. those decades. That mm -hmm. is, this large corporate model of permanent employment yeah. was very powerful uh, mm -hmm. and desirable to many people. It was attainable, I mean, at its peak, there were probably only 40% of the male workforce were actually in uh, positions um, that offered that kind of permanent, secure employment. Okay. Um, and it was not just university graduates. This was a distinction between large corporations and medium small business. And mm -hmm. we tended okay. to focus in those decades, particularly with trade friction on those large uh, sumitomo and those large Japanese corporations with their large workforces of these permanent mm -hmm. workers. But but for chains of subsidiary producers and manufacturers that were much smaller um, mm -hmm. and they rose and fell according to business. There were more bankruptcies in Japan um, of business, business bankruptcies in Japan than any other OECD country in the 1970s and 80s, despite you know this, this, this kind mm -hmm. of presence. So this is what's so, again, so uh, intriguing about Japan to an anthropologist such as myself, that you could have this, the, these kinds of uh, national models of, of correct or uh, prestigious uh, positions that were actually available to a much wider swath of the population than say in the US or, or Britain, um, together with the actual circumstances of life for many people for whom they didn't work for Sumitomo, they might have worked for a third tier subsidiary that made some parts that made it up into Sumitomo Sumo products, but they were much more vulnerable to business cycles. And some of them preferred it that way. You know, they did not want to work for the main corporation, you know, 60 hours a week away from um, a family. You had a much more, you had a diversity of of everyone agreed that this was the standard and desire and and the, the model of prestige but many Japanese said well yes it is but not for me I'd rather work um, in this small machine shop um, uh, and be able to go to the to the to the horse races on Saturday afternoon um, and to go down to the bar at five o'clock in the evening rather than sit in that corporate office until eight o'clock when the boss finally decides to get up and go. You had this sort of interesting is this a combination um, of, of of diversity below the surface um, and a a kind of a standardization. Um, and I say standardization, this is, it's important. I think it's perhaps more like Europe than the United States. But in the 1950s, after World War II, you had enormous labor unrest. Um, mm -hmm. You had multiple longstanding violent strikes um, right. against major manufacturers. So that the, the system of permanent employment that developed and became so characteristic of Japan and so enamored of sociologists and economists and political scientists was not because the Japanese all got along with each other, but because the Japanese actually didn't get along with each other and the workers were very sort of angry, uh, but they wanted the kinds of reforms in the company and the companies felt pressured you know, to make these accommodations to unions um, and bring the, give blue collar workers the same kind of security um, and status protection that their white collar workers um, had. And so you created Toyota and you created Sumitomo as a combination of white collar blue. Everybody, everybody worked for Toyota. And people think, well, that just means because the Japanese are harmonious. No, because everyone who worked for Toyota wanted the same kind of security and the same range, the same range of, of, of benefits. Um, and the companies were forced to do that in order because they saw that as the path forward towards towards economic success, and that worked until the 1990s. Brings me to you know your question about the crisis that precipitated this rather significant shift in opportunities and expectations.
And so, uh, do you think like um, the the three main issues that I referred to when we started talking about uh, contemporary issues, uh, issues that people have to deal with in contemporary Japan, uh, like singlehood, the hikikomori, and uh, rates of suicide? Do you think that? Uh, all of them uh, could be traced back to more or less the same uh, causes related to job instability and perhaps mm -hmm. the social uh, job and economic instability and the social effects uh, they have on in Japanese society. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I would distinguish the three of them are important. But I, I see them in three different ways. And the, and the okay. issue of solo uh, living and solo formation, I think, is, as we were, as we've talked, sort of pr produced out of these demographic and corporate uh, uh, changes that the economy mm -hmm. uh, precipitated. Suicide right. is, is difficult because, uh, difficult in the sense that um, when I first got involved in Japan, it had this yeah. reputation as having the highest suicide rate in in uh, the OECD world. It turns out, you know, when one looks carefully, that that wasn't quite the case. That there were other countries that approached uh, Japan. That okay. suicide in Japan was immediately tied to the high pressure examination system uh, into universities, and so it turned out that actually suicide for to be four years was exceptionally high um, okay. compared to other countries and compared to other age groups. And so people immediately assumed, well, because the, the pressure to get into the University of Tokyo, to get into these top universities so you get into these top corporations was so uh, difficult that it, it, it turns out that, the, that, you know, it was tragic, it was high, but the youth who are committing suicide were not the people who were taking the exams in the University of Tokyo, but the kind of left behinds, you know, mm -hmm. who despaired more generally. And mm -hmm. that actually disappeared. I and mean, Japan had a fairly, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to use the word normal, but a fairly median uh, rate of suicide across all age groups until the 1990s. And then you had an uptick of men in their 50s and early 60s for the reasons that you intimated earlier, the corporate oh, okay. reorganization. And mm -hmm. part of the corporate reorganization was to freeze opportunities for young people coming out of university getting into those jobs. But the other half of it was restructuring. And you know they used this old Soviet term perestroika and they called it restructuring and it meant you know, layoffs and you laid off those upper middle management because they were the most expensive and uh, you, and so you actually had an increase in uh, suicide but also uh, mental distress and alcoholism among older men who had been uh, prematurely laid off from what they thought to be a secure uh, lifeline. So there was that but now in fact the suicide rates are statistically um, well within, uh, I mean, it, it's the United States actually that has the significant uh, okay. suicide uh, problems at the moment. So Japan has, it's been an issue, but and, it, and you can explain it by relating it to these societal trends. Hikikomori, the third issue that you raise, mm -hmm. is, is more difficult because, <laughs> I mean, the notion of withdrawing from society we used to give, I mean, we made Francis of Assisi a saint for doing that. I mean, this notion of, of retreating from society I mean, be considered, used to be considered a, a valuable path towards self-understanding. And now somehow the, 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 the same person sitting in a small room in Tokyo um, is considered a social pathology. Um, it's not. Uh, but but uh, yeah. uh, I mean, when, <laughs> when it comes to comparing those two cases, isn't one of them perhaps more related to things like, I don't know, perhaps we could call it self-enlightenment and the other uh, usually to do with uh, 
desperation or something like that. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it also ties back to some of the pressure people feel from uh, not being able to achieve, uh, to get into university, or to achieve academically and professionally. Because uh, if I if I remember correctly, I think that the statistics coming from Japan about the number of hikikomori uh, uh, relate to people from the ages of 18 up to 39, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So No, no, I, and I don't mean to make light of, and they are, they are different. <laughs> and, and, no, of course, yeah, I, was, of, I was just trying to... St. Francis of Assisi, yeah. but this notion of, of withdrawal and isolation, I mean, it is, it, it is complicated and important. There, I would say two things, not to, to make light of it, but I remain skeptical of... Mm -hmm the extent of the problem, the nature of the problem, and okay. the degree to which the issue in Japan is that much different than the issue in some other societies like the US. And what I mean by that is Japan, the the national government, I mean, from even, bef even before the second half of the 20th century, was, it was very interested in collecting information about its population um, to create policies. And it, it's, it does more surveys of its population for more things than I think, that, as far as I can tell, any other OECD uh, country. So it's always surveying things and, when it's, and it's writing white papers so that problems, in fact, are, are turned to prominent problems with a degree of frequency that you might not find in comparable uh, nation states. An example would be when I uh, when I first engaged with Japan in the 1970s, they were they were all these fears the government had of an aging society. And we looked around and lo and behold, Japan had the youngest population profile of any OECD nation. They were why is the government sort of raising the alarm bells about population um, when it has this population. Well, they're looking ahead. I mean, it's a kind of, there's a, a way of sort of anticipating problems that might arise on the horizon, and they're trying to sort of prepare people and prepare themselves and set the, and hikikomori actually has, there's something of that in, with, with that problem. Um, there okay. are those people, um, and it's especially, perhaps especially prone to twenty-somethings um, or you know, late teenagers. But part of it is the the government, and you know, I mean, the term was actually coined by a university professor in the 1990s, and the TV made much of it, so it became a kind of media buzzword. And that led the government to do these studies and panels to try to, well, we're going to define who is a hikikomori. You know, is it from 18 to 34, 18 to 27? Does it mean that they they don't leave their room or they don't leave their apartment or they, they only engage with their family? I mean, it would be this, this arcane debate um, around this term. Um, and, of course, from the outside, you hear this term and there are these few, these sort of cases, and it sounds like it's... A, a a massive uh, social pathology and you know to some of us sort of looking at this over the long term it sounds suspiciously like um, the ways in which government and and intellectuals who are looking for you know the latest sort of phenomena that they're they're hyping something that might not be as significant um, a social phenomenon as as the media and the government and popular talk make it out to be. Now the risk is you you know you, you trivialize or you overlook some serious right. some serious problems. But I I tend to be somewhat skeptical about that. I mean I see it actually as part of what you raised here. You're solo. I mean this notion of of the the, the ways in which you and you know the the real hiki komori to me real tragedy of the hikikomori are not those 20-somethings who are often 
actually living at home and being supported by their parents you know, to stay in their room. Because the, they bring them the meals and leave them outside the door and they provide the Internet. And they're actually, you know, they're, but it's, it's the, the, six, the 70 year olds and the 80 year olds who are living by themselves um, without you know, family support, with limited community support. That's the, they don't call them hikikomori. They just call them old singles, but that's, to me, the what what I see as the the, the problem that Japan um, has to engage with more directly. Yes, I, I mean, in fact, it's interesting because I, I was just thinking about also touching a little bit on that issue because mm -hmm. I've heard recently. Uh, I wish I could remember the Japanese term because they have the terms for everything, but <laughs> uh, one of them has to do precisely with that, with uh, people, old people who live alone and die alone, right. and uh, people only dead. I don't know much. I'm leader, so right. they, they also have a term for that, but yeah. I, I can't really remember it. But yeah. there's also that. No, there is, and and that it, it is a problem. Statistically, it doesn't happen much, and when it does, the media are quick to descend upon the apartment and 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 raise it. But it it speaks to this larger issue of solitary living and providing the necessary support and and communication. It does have the the beneficial effect of of keeping local authorities and public health officials on their toes. I mean, if, if the media may exaggerate these problems, and this mm -hmm. is, you know, this has more general salience to the way the interactions between media and and, and academics and, and society. I mean, even if they exaggerate the the cases and, and sensationalize them, it does have perhaps a beneficial consequence for alerting um, communities and, and families and social services to um, what can happen and is likely to be at risk at risk populations. Um, so it's 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 as it, as itself is not you know, a, a significant um, a set of cases, but as a diagnostic, um, I think it is. I think it is important. And the other thing about he Komori, the younger he Komori, is we tend to we, we, we think of that that condition, perhaps somewhat anachronistically. I, do, I mean, because many of these so-called self-selective shut-ins have a very lively digital life, you know, and Japanese social media, um, anime, and you know, that kind of digital world, it's not that they have withdrawn from society and with, they might have drawn, withdrawn from analog sociality. And mm -hmm. maybe the kind of digital life that they are embedded in seems bizarre, maybe sometimes perverse, but un strange to us who define sociality in more longer term analog sense. But that's it's another reason why he Komori may not capture what many of these people are doing to re reconstruct themselves find an engaged life. They may be embedded. They may be engaged in ways that we don't fully appreciate. And you know, we, we dismiss it while well, surfing the web or you know these sorts of facetious um, working through avatars, but in fact, to some of them, it's a kind of, of not not substitute, but it's a it's it, it's it's reconstructing their life, responding to the the uh, pressures of conventional expectations, but actually forming new kinds of communication um, and connection um, that again, are not, are, are, sort of elude um, the the social concepts, constructs that we see of the statistics and the analysis. And I would imagine that for a socio-cultural anthropologist that would make for a very 
interesting case for uh, to explore uh, the many different ways also through exposure to new technology and to new medication by which people can establish social relations right? um, yes that's that's quite true it's it's very difficult i had a, a doctoral student whose work was on um, hikikomori and it raises obvious ethical issues any kind of sort of medical qualitative work mm -hmm. Um, yes. And she had many negotiations with IRB boards and the like. Um, and if someone is withdrawn in their room, it's very difficult to do field work in the room with the same. <laughs> of course. I mean, so they're, they're, but they're, they're, you know, they're forms of communication with those sorts of individuals. Um, the, the support staff and there were, um, there are uh, uh, assistance groups of, for parents of, of Higikomori. I mean, there, there are indirect ways in which one can try to understand these, these different cases, and that was the strategy that she used. But it requires, um, like many topics in, mm -hmm. in 21st century social culture, a somewhat different style of, of, of engagement and ethical uh, responsibility than um, when I was working back in the 1970s in, in Shonai. Right, so uh, still focusing on Japan, but mm -hmm. moving on to another topic of your work, uh, you've also studied sports and sport culture in Japan. So mm -hmm. could you tell us first why you got interested in that as a sociocultural anthropologist? I mean, uh, what is it that you can uh, get a better understanding of uh, about a particular society by studying and understanding better uh, their sports, their sports competition, and their sports culture. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make the the, the, the introductory the story of introduction uh, brief, but it actually was not sports per se, but okay national character that drew me into this topic. And it really came from a very specific moment in October in 1985. And it dealt with Japanese professional baseball. I, most of your listeners have no interest in this peculiar American sport or sports generally, but Japan did and Japan played baseball uh, enthusiastically and but by the way the, there are a few sports in japan that are very popular that, uh, it came from america right like right. baseball wrestling wrestling i i think is also very popular yeah. in japan yeah. Yeah. Right. and some of them tennis and golf that sort of came from the u.s but by basically from from britain um okay. and there's american football i mean western sports yeah. along with Western institutions, came into Japan in the late 19th century. And uh, they, they sort of picked and choose. I mean, they don't play cricket, but they play baseball. Um, they didn't play uh, American football, but they played soccer football. And now foot, uh, soccer football is, is associated football is quite important um, in Japan. They took pre-existing sports, or they weren't sports then, but practices like sumo wrestling, um, and they turned them from more ritual entertainment into um, Western-style sports. So this was going on in, in the late 19th century, continued in the 20th century, and for a number of reasons having to do with politics and the media and urban development, mm -hmm. baseball actually became the preeminent uh, sport, um, both in the school system and also for urban entertainment. So you had these baseball stadiums and um, the, the National High School Baseball Tournament started in 1915, became the biggest event um, in Japan and professional started in the 1930s. And so you had um, this, this one sport that um, uh, it included others, sumo wrestling and horse horse racing and gambling sports and um, and, and Olympic uh, 
uh, events. Um, but mm-hmm. baseball really was at the center of, sort of Japanese sports enthusiasm. Um, and that was true throughout the 20th century. And as I say, it was a way of, of, of looking at um, urban development. You know, in Japan, like in, in well, it is where the automobile replaced the streetcar, um, right. cities actually developed through streetcar lines. So in, in Osaka, which was, you know, for most of the 20th century, Osaka and Tokyo were the two rival cities in Japan, um, equal importance. And in both places, um, the city developed in the early 20th century by rival private railroad companies building lines from the perimeter into the city center. And so people's sort of experience of urban living were really defined by the private railroad line that they lived along because they would take that to work or to shopping. Uh, these companies would build department stores, a whole department store sort of consumer culture developed um, by these railroad, these railroad companies. Um, they would buy up the land and develop um, apartment uh, housing um, along their lines. Um, they would build recreational facilities for the people along those lines. So you had these cities that had uh, neighborhood identities that were often shaped by um, the transportation networks um, of those cities. And sports fit into that because um, each of the, in Osaka, you had four of these five companies um, built stadiums and sponsored baseball teams. And so you had this intense rivalry within the cities and between the the Osaka teams and the Tokyo teams um, that were of enormous um, uh, uh, regional uh, rivalries. Um, The media sports newspapers developed um, in each of these cities to to report, to sponsor um, sporting events um, and uh, because baseball was in the school system, um, schools developed, you know, baseball programs around their young boys. And there was an ideology of playing baseball was really the, the, the emblem of, of adolescent masculinity. So all sorts of ways in which baseball, um, particularly in sports more generally, um, were, were important um, to regional development to media, newspaper development, radio, television, um, to notions of of leisure. I mean, going to the baseball stadium all of a sudden became this expression of of leisurely, uh, what you did after work. Um, And so those were the things that that really sort of intrigued me um, as sports were not just something you you did you know, afterward, it was really, it was really the important I should be, and, and then the character of performance, what what gender was, because it highly gendered um, experiences about you know what the, the the attention that the media would pay and the use of sports. So, there, I say it's it is it is odd to me. I didn't start out, and I'm not a sports social scientist. It's something that it, it, it deeply intrigues me. It's odd to me how how marginal sport is as a topic of investigation and 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 theorizing within among the social sciences. There there's some, but compared to other areas of life, it seems to me we miss the chance to see. Um, how these dynamics of race and ethnicity and class and media and nationalism actually express themselves in in so many people's lives around the world. Um, it's a, it, it, it's it's a marginal it's, a, it's such a minority topic within anthropology and other social sciences, but so important to most people, uh, many people in their daily lives. Um, but uh, it wasn't. It, it turned out to, to be an opening to understanding a lot of these dynamics about uh, uh, Japan. And so, before we get into some of the perhaps aspects of sociality and social pho- phenomena that tie to sports culture, and you studied in Japan, um, and I will ask you about two or three of them. Uh, 
do you have uh, do or do you know why is it that uh, sports and sports culture have been apparently so neglected by the social sciences i mean do, do you do you have any idea why people are do not seem to be very interested in studying sports as a social phenomenon and how they might tie to other aspects of uh, living in a particular society? I wish I had an answer to that. It's something I've been thinking about for about 20 years. I don't obsess about it. I mean, I'm not going to be sort of appalled. When I was teaching in Yale College, the undergraduate version of, of uh, the university mm -hmm. um, we there were there there are 5,000 undergraduates and we offered about eight or nine hundred courses each year um, in Yale College these undergraduates of those eight or nine hundred courses I was the only person to be teaching a course on sport in mm -hmm. any discipline now there would be 10 or 15 courses on popular dance and popular music and movies and television and other aspects of popular culture that are important but frankly don't have the sort of the economic and political reach in an international political economy as sport and I would sort of turn to my colleagues and say aren't you missing something <laughs> out of out of 800 courses there's one course on sport and it it was oversubscribed um, but interestingly because you know there would be hundreds of students who would take, I would be able to have some uh, graduate students as teaching assistants and I, I had a hard time finding graduate students to serve as teaching assistants because none of them wanted that on their curriculum vitae. They didn't want it on there because they thought that the academic departments would see participating on sport, that this would be this would be trivial. You know, people you, wouldn't take the course on ethnicity in class which is what I was doing in sport anyway, but you couldn't yeah. call it sport because something as reputable as, as a uh, social science inquiry. So I can't answer your question. I don't know why that, that uh, uh, prejudice uh, exists, um, but uh, but but it does, and I, as I say, I think we we miss the opportunity to to really see, um, as I say, race, class, and ethnicity um, at play, um, both in the in how people perform sport, but also how people spectate uh, sports. Right. So um, let's get into one of the topics you explored in your work. So. What is the connection between sport and body culture? I mean, by, um, uh, I mean, through sports or through, um, uh, through sport, yeah. what kinds of ideas do people develop? And you study this in Japan again, of course, uh, about how bodies should look and how people should, uh, what people, should do with bodies, I guess. Right. Well, I guess what I came to think about sports, both from participation and from observe, I mean, from being a spectator, but then being a spectator of spectators, being being an anthropologist, was in a, in an interesting way, sports are both the most modern and the most anti-modern realm of life. Um, at present, that is, if I mean modernity can be theorized in many different ways, but right. common to many of these alternative theorizations is a sense that modernity involves sort of the the creation and the defense of 
certain distinctions, the distinction between the sacred and the secular, the distinction between the mind and the body, the distinction between work life and workplaces and domestic life and domestic places, the distinctions between male and female. And sport um, often serves to, to sort of display and demonstrate and reinforce um, those distinctions that are fundamental to a vocabulary um, of the modern experience. Um, and particularly on the aspect of, I mean, sport is a highly gendered experience. And so watching male bodies, you know, in contest sort of induces this sense of, of power as is associated with the male body and, and the physical, I mean, it's physical. It's not, you, you, you don't, it's not mind or anything. So sport is, 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 a, is, a, is a quintessential sort of expression of this modern urge to discriminate. But at the same time, it is the most anti-modern because sports are always sort of, uh, of undermining those kinds of, those kinds of distinct, calling them into question. Um, sports as leisure, except everyone talks about working out and going for the burn and try, trying as hard as you can. So this, this sports is, is, is on the one hand, a quintessential leisure activity, but the other hand, it's really the most work that you actually do. Um, not just with your body, but with your mind. Sports is not physical. I mean, maybe physical um, in a boxing ring or, or, or a soccer pitch, but it requires the coordination of mind and spirit, you know, the sense of enduring and the light and body. It's, just, it's actually the combination of mind, spirit, and body in this, in these, in these sort of, it's this point sports entertain. Um, that's why it was promoted in these uh, early modern in these modern cities to, to as leisure activities um, for the working class to kind of uh, uh, diffuse any sort of class anti. But it's also to educate. I mean, sports are pedagogical. They're supposed to teach discipline. They're supposed to teach teamwork. They're supposed to teach loyalty and personal character. And so sports are really this edutainment. There's really this mix of or this constant tension between entertainment and education. So in, as I say, in, in lots of ways, um, sports are uh, this sort of self-contradictory or this sort of conundrum that both presents um, the the elements of modernity and constantly calls them constantly calls them them in, into into in, into uh, a question um, and the same with you know these, we watch elite athletes on the soccer pitch sitting in stands um, you know come totally out of shape drinking beer I mean the sports spectating sports is this odd notion of of the body in its most Sort of trained and 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 physically impressive um, sense um, being watched by fifty thousand people in the most dissolute, you know, uh, out of shape. I mean, it's, it's really it brings together in the same place <laughs> this kind of, of spectrum of of attention to and cultivation um, of the of the body um, that I'm not sure that. Any other, I mean, a concert hall or a dance club or anything else uh, actually represents. And so, uh, another thing that I found really interesting when reading part of your work about sports is how geopolitics sometimes uh, gets tied to it. So, uh, it can the Olympics. I mean, whenever people talk about the Olympics, what we usually hear is that it's a coming together of people from all around the globe, people from uh, virtually every country in the globe. But, uh, I mean, in your work, you explore topics like, for example, how nationalism, regionalism and globalism manifest in the Olympics and I would imagine other massive sports events. Mm -hmm. So could, could you tell us about that? Well, precisely. The Olympics, I mean, are the largest, as they like to style themselves, the largest sports gathering in the world periodically. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the oddest 
sports gathering in the world. I mean, we have the World Cup in soccer in which teams get together to play soccer. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have the World Series in which teams get together for the baseball championship. But the Olympics is this this odd sort of Borges Chinese box of these different sports, almost all of which nobody really understands. I mean, we we pay attention to the to the to the biathlon once every four years because it's an Olympic event or or horse jumping, equestrian or sailboat. And the people who watch, we don't follow the 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 participants and we don't know the rules and we only see the sport every four years. And yet, we've got you know billions of. Uh, people who are watching and consuming the, the 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 ideology, you know, this is this also is the sport or the sporting event that has the most pretentious claims about what sport does to elevate the human condition, the fellowship and the sportsmanship and the gathering of 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 individuals from all over the world, as you were saying, run by among the tawdriest um, organization of sort of self-appointed um, uh, oligarchs sitting in Lausanne, Switzerland, making an absolute fortune through bribes and manipulations costing these cities. So it's, again, this, this juxtaposition of the most elevated ambitions and the most corrupt uh, sporting uh, practices in the sponsorship, um, and and this, uh, I mean, it also goes back to this the, the the sports more generally and the way they both present an idealization and then immediately undermine it. Um, we have we have men's events and women's events in the Olympics. And originally it was only men's events and calling the Olympics out for not fulfilling its ambitions led to bringing more and more women's events in to the point where, you know, there is a rough equality between men and women. In fact, in most countries where women's sports um, are drastically underdeveloped from men's sports, in fact, the the opportunity for women to win medals in the Olympics has led to enormous sort of development of women's sports. So it's had the Olympics have had a real progressive effect um, on the deve- the recent development of women's sports in many different countries in many different um, uh, uh, kinds of sports. Precisely um, because that is a way to build medal. Um, uh, 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 medals in in Olympic competition, as you say, this is the, it's supposed to be in the spirit of fellowship. And you march in by national unit, um, and you, the name of your country is on your uniform, and medals are. So you have this this clash of 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 ambition and expectations on internet on global display. Um, every every two years now through the winter and, and, and summer games. And so it's this sort of spectacular um, uh, um, uh, d- display of the, the country uh, of sports presence and the ways in which sport not just represents but actually motivates um, a, a, a change. Um, what counts as what counts as male? What counts as female? I mean, these these sort of tests that they've run that every test they come up with is found to be totally bogus, and so you move to a different level. You know, it used to be this uh, visual inspection of anatomy back in the 50s and 60s, and it became genetic and now chromosomal. Well, what they've demonstrated is that this whole male female construction is is artificial. It's a social construction, um, and the distinction between male sports and female sports is is a, a, a deliberate construction of, of the sports world. Um, so that as I say, there are all sorts of uh, ma- is manner in which the Olympics can both consolidate um, and uh, critique 
um, the existing relations among individuals, nations, uh, sports, um, in the in the oddest of circumstances, by bringing together 30, 35 sports that are is not the World Cup, is not the I mean not the most famous sport in the world. <laughs> And in the case of gender, particularly in recent years, there's been a huge political debate surrounding uh, transgender individuals. And if, for example, a trans women should uh, participate in women's sports and stuff mm -hmm. like that, because uh, people say or argue that uh, the, the reason why we divide sports between men and women or only let women uh, play against other women is because if we allowed men to do so then they would uh, women would be completely outcompeted but mm -hmm. i mean uh, if i understand your argument there correctly then i mean it's uh, the issue here is much more complicated than just looking at people and saying so this person should only play in male sports and that one only in female sports because <clears throat> some of this is socio-culturally constructed mm -hmm. right. and politically constructed in support of a gender hierarchy um, Yes, and, and again, it speaks to sport. I mean, sport is rule-governed physical competitions. So mm -hmm. if it's rule-governed, it's immediately an artifice, a human artifice. Um, and one can point to examples within sports where gender is not the defining differentiator. Um, there is certainly at my university, many universities, male rowing and female rowing. But rowing is categorized into heavyweight and lightweight and freshman rowing. I mean, we have other ways of ensuring that or trying to create competition mm -hmm. that is level, that doesn't right. involve male and female. Mm -hmm. um, we have weight classes in wrestling and right. weight classes in boxing. Mm -hmm. Now you could have a flyweight uh, 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 level that made no gender distinctions. Um, you could have, I mean, certainly in things like um, now that uh, rock climbing has moved in during you have speed climbing in these various, you, you can have gender blind um, competitions um, that involve skill levels and weight levels. You could even you know, one has their proposals for testosterone levels. You know, it has nothing to do with male, female, but you have testosterone categories um, for different uh, levels of competition within the same sport. Um, the most uh, uh, successful sports team um, at my university over the last couple of years <clears throat> has actually been the mixed sailing. They're national champions for, for many years. Years requires a male and now in the boat. Yeah. It's notice equestrian sports often the women riders are more accomplished than the male riders. So one can find in mm -hmm. the sports world itself um, examples, but also ways in which you can, through the same artifice of rule construction, create. Um, uh, compelling physical competitions um, that uh, avoid um, these kinds of. I mean, the, the you know the sports that we put together, like American football, American basketball, um, are made are constructed to foreground to privilege uh, male mm -hmm. athletes and the kinds of skills um, that the most male, not all of us certainly, but the most male, developed male bodies possess we um, a more fluid um, a notion of 
gender identity and uh, and, and 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 sex, um, we could, I think, uh, address many of these concerns that that people have about um, the ways in which breaking down these distinctions will destroy sports and um, uh, eliminate the ex- the experience of of sports competition for um, those who aren't the strongest, the fastest. Um, uh, and this, uh, that's about uh, gender, other uh, social uh, constructions like, for, uh, social constructs like, for example, ethnicity and race that also manifest in particular ways in sports events or perhaps the way we tend to think socially about those categories mm-hmm. also manifest in that particular yeah, certainly uh, there has been, I mean, sports have been used to perpetuate certain uh, racial uh, imaginations um, and physical, I mean, this, this, the track world, of course, is, mm-hmm. is uh, full of, of those sorts of examples and the notion that there are certain uh, ethnic groups or racial categories that have a higher fast twitch muscle than a slow twitch muscle and that gives them a, a natural advantage to be the the sprinters, um, the Usainian bolts um, of the world. And, you know, it, it does frequently turn out that it's not the long-standing genetic endowments of uh, certain Kenyan or Ethiopian runners that has made them currently um, at the top of the long distance uh, marathon world. Um, but, you know, the combination of certain genetic endowments that are favored by certain physical environments together with um, some very particular social conditions of certain areas. I mean, not all high altitude Kenyans are world class marathoners and uh, certainly not all high altitude Ethiopians are that they're around particular towns with particular individuals, certain resources or the lack of certain resources. There's a whole it's a confluence Mm -hmm. of uh, physical, but physical in the sense of, of perhaps a, a genetic, but more importantly, the experiences um, in the socialization, the training, the political resources, um, the national support, the local support that creates um, certain uh, groups uh, to have at least temporary um, sort of uh, uh, a, a success. I mean, one thinks, for instance, in, in the American basketball case. Mm-hmm. Um, that you had this shift once racial barriers were somewhat relaxed in the 1970s and African-American uh, 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 players were had more opportunities in the professional leagues. And in the 80s, Michael Jordan all came, you know, the, there was the talk that, you know, the African-Americans were just naturally um, developed to be the superior basketball players until we started getting this influx of European players into the NBA um, and Australian players, and now African players of various sorts. And the the NBA, this National Basketball Association, had become a much more um, collection or a collection of of global athletes. And the sort of the predictions that genetics would determine the superiority of these athletes over and over has been shown to be you know, premature, temporary, uh, uh, mis- misplaced. So I'm, I'm always a, a skeptical of too direct an association because sports, I mean, sports seems so physical and, and therefore we think, well, there's got to be a, there's got to be a, a biological, a genetic and endocrinological basis to uh, sports superiority. And yet we find you know, over and over, there's so many intervening um, mitigating factors um, of technology and opportunity um, and 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 social uh, engagement um, that that produce and that you know th- these are 
an elite athlete is such a rare specimen of the human species. <laughs> that, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and not only that, but I imagine, uh, I think that uh, even if there are some, uh, if there is a biological basis to it, it doesn't necessarily map onto sociocultural constructs like uh, race. Right. right, right, very much so. I mean, partly because the social cultural construct of race like that of gender, I mean, has, mm -hmm. has shifted. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, it's defined in one national context one way, another national context a very different way. I um, mean, race in Brazil and race in the U.S., it, it, it's, these are very uh, loosely articulated uh, uh, constructs. Yeah, I, I mean, perhaps one thing that people forget is that even in the history of the U.S., some people that now no one questions that they are white oh, yes. in the late 19th century, early 20th century, were not socially nor politically considered white. No, that, that, that's very central to, to, to current racism. The, uh, the, these groups came to the U.S. to become white. Yeah. You know, they came from Ireland, they came from the Mediterranean, they came from Eastern Europe um, to become white. They weren't white until they arrived in this category of white American, um, consolidated itself um, and, 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 and re-racialized um, yeah. what had been uh, other kinds of categorizations. Okay, so uh, let's get into one final set of questions, and this set of questions is more general, uh, more about ethnography and sociocultural anthropology. So when it comes to ethnography, uh, I, I would like to hear more about your thoughts, about its nature and how it's done, because there are uh, many people in the sciences and uh, also some of them in anthropology itself that, um, I mean, disparage a little bit uh, some ethnographic work because sometimes it's more uh, qualitative, not so much quantitative. And so mm -hmm. some uh, perhaps some of the tools that are uh, considered more rigorous within the sciences to mm -hmm. arrive at what's uh, through uh, what's true about the behavior of people in a particular society for example uh, i mean do not uh, apply there so uh, easily or so uh, obviously so uh, i mean what do you think uh, uh, is the importance of ethnography and work for anthropology and science more generally? Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly been a, a guiding issue and concern for me um, over over my career, and I think you're right to to identify that as as really a, a signal or accomplishment or a characteristic of social cultural anthropology. Um, and I think part of the problem is that we anthropologists don't do a very good job of explaining ourselves to our colleagues about the, the, work, the work that we do. This word ethnography, um, I mean, when I, students come to interview for the doctoral program, I, you know, what do you, well, I want to go and do an ethnography. And I said, what do you mean by that? And said, well, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some field work and come back and write it up. Um, and I'm doing ethnography. And I said, well, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. I mean, ethnography to me is actually the product of a fairly long research process. Um, it is typically a book length monograph that tries to comprehensively and in its own way systematically um, represent um, the life experiences and the structuring conditions of a locality or a social situation. It can be an ethnography of a group of settlements. 
It can be an ethnography of a school. It can be an ethnography of a factory, an ethnography of a subway system, an ethnography of a refugee camp, um, an ethnography of an NGO organization. There are many different, obviously, objects, as you know, that have been the subject of of an ethnography. But that's really often, I mean, there, there are two ways, it seems to me, in which we don't um, adequately characterize uh, what we do. I mean, the first is to elide the field work, um, which is itself a rather sloppy term for what we're doing over a year or two, um, and the writing of an ethnography um, after afterwards. Um, in fact, you know that work in Shonai, the, this initial work took ten years. Now, so I started. Um, with that experience in in northern U.S., I came back. Um, I spent a year reading as much as I could the works about irrigation societies in different parts of the world and in Japan, um, designing a research project in terms of writing grant proposals to three different foundations, none of which were successful, I should say, the first time. It took me two rounds. Um, going off and, and spending two years um, in Shonai, in this area, coming back, spending another year trying to go through the written materials, the archival materials I put together, um, writing a dissertation over another 18 months and criticizing, and then the dissertation facing um, a, a an outside reader as well as inside investigator uh, in, inside supervisors. Um, once the dissertation was done, two years later, I finally produced a book from the dissertation, which was a significant revision. So, t doing ethnography really was a ten-year process that was a kind of iterative research between trying to grapple with the. Uh, the comparative cases, uh, theoretical constructs, community, and 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 the like. Um, this field work, research experience, uh, multiple drafts to uh, uh, produce a dissertation to different kinds of audiences: my supervisor, the outside reader, the press readers, um, and the book readers, and the tenure committee that followed. So, doing ethnography is actually not just going out and hanging out and doing a little bit of observing and participating in, in, in writing it up. It is actually a not just a long and not just a structured, but as I say, this iterative process of going back and forth between um, what people, what you're doing and what people are saying about what you're doing and what you're learning about uh, work that has been done in, in that field has been about concepts or theories that might be relevant, um, testing them, going back and retrying them. So it's it's it, it is a um, it's a very it's very challenging, very satisfying, but it is not any kind of, of elevator uh, quick uh, definition that we must give. And the only other thing, if I can add, that that it complicates it is field work itself is. A misleading term. Yes, you're working, and yes, you're in in a field of some. You're in a situation, but it involves, first of all, you know, a lot more than just sitting there looking and kind of observing and sort of jumping into a conversation or jumping into a, a work party or or the like. Mm -hmm. um, one thing which is we one thing that it involves is constant uh, note taking. And this sounds, you know, obvious, sounds trivial, but in fact, it's absolutely fundamental. You know, every day that you are in this situation, day after day, month after month, for a year, for two years, um, you really need the discipline of sitting down and writing out or typing out a record of what occurred, what occurred to you, what you were listening to, what you understood um, of that day. Um, it can be you know, late at night, sometimes you're a little too tired, a little too hungover, you got to do it first thing in the morning. But in fact, it is more of a disciplined method um, than we sometimes uh, forget to mention.
to our colleagues who are suspicious of this kind of just hanging out uh, method because the act of sort of daily reflection is actually the ways in which you realize you know, things that you understand, things you don't understand, things that you think might be leading you somewhere or not leading you somewhere, that it is itself a kind of iterative uh, a, a, a research, a investigatory uh, process um, that, that does structure um, uh, the experiences that you have and give some sort of, of, of self uh, retrospection um, as you're going through it. And that's a very different experience than the act of writing or of drafting and revising and revising and presenting and responding. So I, I say uh, this, I think that if one, you know, if you have kindly indulged me the time to go on about this experience, um, in fact, what is sort of the core style of design and research and writing and representation for us is, is actually, I mean, it has its serious limitations, but it also has, you know, very powerful potential um, to, to get at <clears throat> this tension between you know what people understand about what their life is like and why their life is like the way they think it is and what you might be sort of observing um, to the side about things that they may not recognize or they may recognize in a different way the sort of triangulation of perspective over a long period of time to to really get at the context, the, the sort of internal and external conditions that are uh, creating um, their that particular sociality. I think all of that is what is is what ethnography has come to be about for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, generally speaking, mm -hmm. what would you say? Uh, are the contributions of socio-cultural anthropology to social science that you think uh, some of the work it does um, uh, perhaps complements other work done in other specific subfields of anthropology and perhaps we couldn't uh, get from them or it enriches the, the work from other fields in particular ways, perhaps. Yeah. Well, I like, I like the way you put the question because I don't see, uh, for instance, qualitative and quantitative uh, methods as in conflict or that there's yeah. a choice that has to be made between the two. I mean, there's a lot of quantitative work that I do in the field in, in the course of my experience, it's not the kind of quantitative or experimental work that a that a, uh, that a psychologist uh, might do. Um, I think you know one of the I think there there are two uh, uh, qualities to the kind of work we do that contribute uh, to the social sciences, um, and one has to do with contextualization. I mean, lives are led in context lives are grounded in uh, perhaps universal qualities of the species or general tendencies, but also in the specific conditions that we face, um, that we must uh, work our daily lives through. Um, and that kind of, of the, the groundedness of social action um, is difficult to to capture, it's even difficult to understand, say, in an experimental or laboratory situation when the point is to remove the individual from a natural setting and put him into experimental conditions. Um, and there are certain insights that can be gained for that, um, but <clears throat> they're equally important. I mean, I would say more important, but at least for the conversation, we'll say equally important um, understandings about um, uh, uh, those social actors um, to uh, from their naturally existing uh, life situations. And that's what sort of long-term so-called qualitative um, intensive uh, field work engagement can produce. The second 
um, is a, a real commitment to trying to understand the ways in which the people themselves um, see their lives being played out. Uh, we don't necessarily take that at face value. I mean, most of us actually are not the best interpreters of our own life. Um, but the ways in which we interpret our lives um, are certainly central to the choices we make and the ways in which we behave with each other in constructing our lives. So that has to be taken seriously. Again, if you, if you, re, if you take humans as social agents and put them into situations in which you're asking questions from a schedule of questions, um, or you have created some experimental circumstances about, you know, games of cooperation, to take an example from one of your other interviews. Um, you're, 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 realizing certain, you're, you're realizing certain insights, but what you're ignoring um, are the terms in which they themselves uh, mm -hmm. believe that they are uh, uh, leading their lives. And so I think those two are really uh, essential um, contributions that maybe can come out of other circumstances, but are much more likely to um, uh, be yielded from the kind of uh, research that uh, social cultural anthropology has 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 best uh, produced um, um, over its time. Uh, also, uh, if you if you will allow me and. Uh, Please also tell me if you disagree with me, but I think that uh, lab studies and studying people in more controlled conditions, mm -hmm. that's all fine, of course, but uh, even uh, if the goal there is also to develop some sort of causal understanding of what moves people, what causes this or that particular behavior, or why people behave this or that way, or react this or that way to this or that, or how specific aspects of our psychology work, uh, to, uh, to get really a causal understanding of that, uh, removing people from their socio-cultural context, perhaps uh, get into some of the factors that play a role in their behavior, but what we get from that is probably a very limited understanding of causality, because we are sort of trying to remove context from the picture. Mm -hmm. right. no, no, I agree. I, I, I still respect that kind of investigation. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. Yeah. Because it can't, I mean, all of us in our daily lives <clears throat> are sifting out. We can't hold everything in yeah, our heads sure. <laughs> in order to figure out the next move in our social mm -hmm. engagement. So we're always having to you know, develop these sort of templates and workarounds and, and, mm -hmm. and make, these, make these choices. And so the notion of trying to reach understandings by doing that um, seems to me a, a very human uh, inclination. Um, but I do agree with you that the cost of that um, is to, uh, um, uh, to, to, for, uh, to foreclose the possibilities of, of understanding other uh, causes or motivations or inclinations in that setting um, that may in fact be behind what people choose to do or feel they're forced to do. Um, and, ethnog and field work that leads to, you know, kind of ethnographic product, um, a, a presentation that, um, as they say, that, that both tries to balance <clears throat> the unbalanceable, try to balance adequately, responsibly representing um, what people are and what they do and what they think they do on the one hand with trying to reason um, about what they're doing, trying to develop concepts that sometimes are not concepts derived from their lives, sometimes they are, um, to try to balance this representation and reasoning about um, their lives. That's what, that's what makes an exemplary ethnography to me.
Okay, so uh, Dr. Kelly, I think that perhaps this would be a good point to end the interview on. I think we covered a lot of ground today and uh, be, just before we go, would you like perhaps to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Um, trying to remember the URL. Um, but well, I, if you don't remember the specific URL, you can just uh, I think it's tell important. us the name of the institutions or something like that, and then I will leave the corresponding links in the description. No, I, I, I have let my website uh, lapse a bit um, over the last six months and must go, but I, one thing I've tried to do, and I feel it's a real responsibility of scholars, is to make their work available online so that all of my articles and publications and books actually as PDFs um, are available if people are interested in any of those topics or themes. Um, and uh, I believe it's www.kelly.org uh, that is the current uh, repository. Um, and um, I'm always happy to respond to questions and challenges and interests that yeah. have. Okay, so thank you so much again for your time and it was really a fascinating conversation. Thank you yeah, so well, much. Thank you and I appreciate your the series that you do and the ways in which you bring so many different kinds of social sciences in this kind of to juxtapose uh, the, the dialogues. It's a great service. Thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you.